So, uh, as some of you know, I've been in the process of uh, getting a PhD in philosophy and religion at the California Institute of Integral Studies, and I'm just now, finally, after um, several years of coursework um, and two comprehensive exams, uh, I'm beginning to write the proposal for the dissertation itself, um, which involves really um, hammering out a uh, very short, like, two-sentence thesis statement, um, which is kind of uh, contained or enfolded within the title. So working out the title is, is really important, for me at least, um, because the title sort of forms uh, a microcosm of the rest of the project. Uh, and so once I get the title and a thesis statement that unpacks the title, then I'll need also um, for my proposal an outline, um, breaking up sort of the, the chapter headings um, to show how I'm going to approach the, the problem the, or the problematic that my thesis draws me into. So my title, as of, as of now, is um, Imagination Between Science and Religion, uh, the subtitle being um, Towards a Cosmotheandric Philosophy. So imagination, then, is the, is the centerpiece here. And uh, my thesis here is that um, uh, the current schism between what generally we will call science uh, and generally religion, um, that, that schism is a result of um, a certain relationship or way of relating to um, imagination by philosophy, by the philosophical tradition. So um, in order to heal this schism or in order to bring science and religion back into a, f a fruitful, mutually enhancing conversation um, and interaction uh, culturally and um, as part of the ongoing project of civilization, uh, I'm, I'm going to turn again from a philosophical perspective uh, to religion uh, and to science. Um, and I'm going to do so through what I'm calling imagination. Um, you know, my principal influences here when I use this word imagination are the English romantics, the American romantics and transcendentalists. Um, so Coleridge, Wordsworth, Keats, Shelley, uh, Byron, um, and uh, also the American romantics, Emerson, Thoreau and um, Whitman, um, and also German romantics like Schelling and Goethe, uh, and um, um, you know Hegel, Kant, Fichte, and Hegel also. And the way that I think all of these figures from the history of philosophy and poetry and art. Um, the way that they all relate and what they basically agree upon is that there's this mysterious power, as Kant calls it, that um, it provides the um, uh, dynamical process out of which uh, nature and consciousness emerge. So at the roots of our own human faculties of reason and understanding and intuition or um, perception and sensation um, at the origin of these manifold faculties is one power that um, our own conscious awareness and understanding can't actually understand can't actually assimilate into the working of <clears throat> concepts and categories and of our intuitions of space and time, um, imagination somehow outruns both 
our sensory experience of the external world and outruns our intellectual experience of um, the psychological world or the interior world. Imagination lies in between um, sense and uh, spirit. Imagination is, uh, well, I'm going to argue, the common source of what we call sense and what we call spirit, um, or what we call science and what we call religion. Uh, and the cosmotheandric uh, element here, or stylistic feature of, of this, this thesis, is that um, a philosophy that is attuned to the power of imagination, or the force, or the movement of imagination, um, will be cosmotheandric, which is to say it will um, be simultaneously open to the mutual indwelling uh, of the cosmos or the universe, theos or the divine, and anthropos or um, the human. So cosmos, uh, God, and anthropos. Now, what this means is that the uh, I'm going to have to um, approach cosmology, anthropology, <clears throat> and theology from a philosophical perspective such that all three of these um, distinct uh, modes of uh, of cognition and uh, of existence become um, really re reducible to some underlying um, dynamic structure or some underlying um, transcendental uh, genotype, let's say. Um, and this, this underlying um, creative source, of course, is imagination, right? So one thing I'll have to steer clear of immediately and, and explicitly so is this notion that imagination is somehow a faculty of the subject, something that a conscious ego can use, like it, uh, to use uh, to understand and explain the world, like it might use um, its physical organs of perception, or like it might use its the categories of its understanding. Um, imagination, I'm going to claim and argue, is not mine or yours. It doesn't belong to a subject or an ego, but rather um, than the ego imagining uh, whatever it may want to imagine. The ego itself is imagined by uh, something external to, or um, what Schelling would, would say is unprethinkable to the ego, uh, and to anything the ego might think about or reflect upon. Imagination is always pre-reflective, not only pre-reflective, but generative of new forms of reflection. Um, so imagination doesn't isn't just uh, a static code. It's not that type of genotype. It's um, an ongoing genetic process, right? It's it's a it's a genesis, not a genotype, perhaps. And so, part of my project then is is going to be to, um, you know, through the eyes of the Romantic tradition as it has passed from Germany to England and on to America, um, eventually reaching Whitehead. Uh, Alfred North Whitehead, who's going to be a major figure that um, I will draw from in this dissertation, um, I'm going to uh, also critique the romantic understanding of imagination, though, um, it, because the romanticism does have a subjectivist bias, and part of my attempt to avoid that subjectivist bias is going to bring me... Um, you know, into physics and uh, evolutionary theory uh, and um, chemistry, uh, you know, philosophical takes on, on these scientific fields, because, you know, I'm, I'm not getting a PhD in physics or um, chemistry or anything. Uh, I'm studying the explanatory strategies of these, of these sciences, 
and so in other words, I'm studying the way that these sciences bleed over into philosophy uh, of their own accord, from their own institutional momentum. Um, and I'm going to try to respond to these sciences in a way that's, um, well, rather in awe of what they have achieved and what they have discovered. Um, 20th and 21st century physical cosmology have completely turned upside down and inside out our common sense understanding of the human's place in the universe. A um, hundred years ago, we thought that only one galaxy existed, and that um, the universe itself uh, had always existed as some, you know, giant container um, within which permanent laws um, unfolded deterministically. And today, w what we've discovered through the improvement of our theories and the uh, increased complexity of our technology and sensitivity of our instruments, um, what, we've, what we've uncovered today is that um, actually there are hundreds and hundreds of billions of galaxies um, in our universe. And really, we can't even quite see to the edge of it, so even an attempt to quantify the number of galaxies finitely um, may be premature, because what we've noticed, what we've learned, is that the universe is, is an energy event um, rather than uh, a static mechanism or machine. Um, the universe is an energy event that we can trace back um, to uh, around 13.7 billion light years ago or away. You know, space and time sort of collapse into a singularity at this at this um, scale. And, you know, we're talking about the scale of, I guess, what, a photon or um, the um, Planck's, Planck's dimension uh, of space and time of the singularity point. Um, and evolution, evolutionary science has shown us that this single point has somehow ramified, uh, expanded, cooled off, and organized itself into um, atoms and stars and galaxies and planets and um, cells, plants, uh, reptiles, mammals, birds, human beings. Um, the universe spontaneously emerged from this point of uh, infinite density into everything that we see around us, all of the phenomena that we experience consciously um, through our five senses and the categories of understanding that seem to be um, innately placed in us. So, this whole notion of innate ideas is, is kind of tricky, right? Because it's basically saying that there's a little spark of God in each one of us um, that allows us to understand the universe as it truly exists independently of us. Um, that is, as only its creator would know, a, a type of knowledge only its creator would have has been implanted in the human being somehow. Um, you know, that's what we think of science as, as allowing us to know, right? A creator's perspective on the universe. We want to know the laws of physics. We want to know what um, causes the whole thing to unfold in the way that it does. And part of what we learn also involves uh, or provides us with the power um, to control, to tinker with, to redesign what has been created. So science and technology, of course, emerge um, in this closely, this close collaboration um, of mutual influence. Um, and, you know, religion too is based on this idea that each of us has a little spark of God, or that each of us has um, a, f a phone line um, straight to the mind of God, and that through prayer we can communicate with that intelligence and that. Um, uh, abiding presence of love that we can feel that immediately uh, you know so we have with these two modes of existence science 
on the one hand and religion on the other, we have two uh, modes of life also. Um, but life uh, itself is not a mode, right? So there's there's life, and I think as living beings, we are thrown in these two directions, um, the scientific and the religious, or the mythic and the um, theoretical, the rational or the, or the poetic. And both are fully valid, and both provide us with not only knowledge of reality, um, but help to create that part of reality which we are. Um, we are uh, intelligent entities, rational beings, and we are um, poetic animals, ensouled sub-creators, um, and our function in the universe as human beings um, is to become gods, I would say, to make gods also. You know, and I'm, I'm riffing on uh, Henri Bergson's um, famous last lines in um, his book, uh, Two Sources of Morality and Religion. Um, 